This is Chthonia, the world of the dark feminine. Hello and welcome to Chthonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke. This week, I'm going to take a turn, a very short turn, um, perhaps this episode and the next one, into talking about Native American dark mother figures. Now, the reason that the list is so short here is that there doesn't seem to be, there aren't a whole lot of dark mother figures in Native American folklore. Uh, I was actually, I had a request from uh, someone from one of the Northwest tribes whose name, uh, I, I know what the name is, I, I couldn't possibly say it. <laughs> um, she, she did express it a different way in the comment um, that I, if I can find that comment again, I think the um, phonetic spelling that she provided is much more reasonable. But, um, but, and she had complained of the same thing that, you know, I'm, I'm, ha- I'm trying to research some of these myths on my own and even about my own tribe and I just can't find anything. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that in Native American mythologies and that a lot of them, uh, they're, again, it, it, you can't generalize because they're all, they're all different in their own way. Um, but there's a lot of cases where there isn't necessarily so much of a formal creation myth. And then there's other ones that they do bear resemblances to ones from other parts of the world, uh, though it would be a mistake to say that this, um, you know, that, that these myths somehow, um, you know, that there's, it, it, in the same way, for example, if we talk about Greece and Rome, or we talk about Greece and Persia, or Greece and, you know, Greece, Persia, and Egypt, you're talking about things in roughly a, the same geographic area. So you can easily, uh, you know, it, it, would, it would not be a far stretch to suggest that as these groups traveled by boat to each other's areas, that they were influenced by each other's um, mythology, religion, or made comparisons, or said, oh, you worship this, that's the same for us as this. You know, that's not uh, an out-of-the-question kind of uh, scenario. Uh, however, having said that, uh, you know, you can't, you can't really compare in that way. You can't compare, say, Greek and Roman mythology to that of the Native American, uh, because, you know, there's a lot of both linguistic and um, even geographical connections that can't, just, can't readily be made there. So they, they are quite different. Um, and yet, at the same time that they're different, there are some similarities that uh, don't you know, that, that don't mean that, you know, uh, I think it was expressed in an article I read somewhere is, oh, they have pyramids in Egypt and pyramids in South America. So therefore, you know, it's the same pyramid builders in both places or, you know, it, it doesn't, it makes no suggestion of anything of that kind. Um, and the thing about that thing about the pyramids wouldn't, doesn't, doesn't make any sense either. But, it, you know, it, it's not necessarily that there was some kind of unified geography. Certainly there's no way to, to prove that any of that uh, bears any relationship to the, the similarities. Um, you know, you, you can appeal to Jungian theory. A lot of people don't like to. Um, but there's this, you know, there's also this possibility that the symbolisms, you know, regardless of culture, regardless of the environment, regardless of the anthropological considerations, do seem to be, um, they bear interesting similarities, shall we say. So, having said all that, I haven't even told you who we're talking about today, and that's Sedna. Uh, Sedna is a, uh, from the Inuit mythology, what we used to call the Eskimo, but uh, the Inuit, and there are of course different, um, different branches of the Inuit, uh, depending on where they're, where they're located, but generally Inuit are, you know, function in more Arctic climates. Um, you know, we talk about Greenland, we talk about Inuit who are in Alaska, and in other, you know, farther north places that are, um, you know, where they might be reliant on, on fishing, where they're reliant on the water, where the environment they live in is quite frozen, or at least very cold, a great deal of the time. So Sedna um, has many, goes by a number of different names, and I'm not sure I'm going to product, uh, correctly pronounce all of them. There's also Sana, Sedna, or Sidne, um, also known in parts of Greenland as, let's see if I can say this right, Arnakuasak. Uh, and also Sasuma Arna, the mother of the deep. Um, and uh, Nerevik is another name, meaning table. Uh, and then also in the Northwest Territories, uh, she's either known as Nuliajuk 
uh, if I'm saying that right, or Nuliajuk. I'm not, I'm not, again, I'm not, um, I make no pretense to getting any of this right. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, and other groups, as uh, she's referred to as the big bad woman, or let's see if I can say this, Arnap Kapfaluk in the Copper Inuit, and then also as the um, uh, Takana Kapsaluk, tak- or, or uh, Takanaluk. Okay. In, and in um, the Labrador, she's referred to as the old woman who lived in the sea. Okay, so <laughs> quite a mouthful for the start of a podcast. And let's see, there is other there are other names that I've seen as well. Let me see if I can find these other ones. Um, let me see if it's uh, in this particular thing. Okay, no, I feel like I feel like there's a whole other group of names that I've missed. But in any case, we get the idea. Sedna goes by many names. So let's um, so let's start and let's talk about who she is and what her legend is. As you can tell from some of the names, she's associated with the the sea, with the deep, but she's also considered to be the goddess who rules the underworld. Okay. So let's let's look at what her stories are and her attributes. So first, her myth, and I'm, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's not, a lot of the information that I found in different places is quite similar to what I found on Wikipedia um, and, and other um, mythological encyclopedias and, um, you know, other things. There's not a, a whole lot of, you know, I don't, I don't have a book of Inuit folk tales or anything in front of me, but there seems to be a good summary of what her core myths are. So let's start with uh, this. They, first of all, they say there's more than one version of the legend. And some legends have her as the daughter of a goddess called, uh, let's see if I can say this, Esara Tetsok, while others only mention her father. And, uh, and by the way, if any Inuit are listening, and I've completely butchered that name, I apologize because I'm looking at it going, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right at all. Okay. Anyway, in one legend, Sedna is a giant, the daughter of the creator god Anguta, with a great hunger that causes her to attack her parents. Angered, Ang- Anguta takes her out to sea, and throws her over the side of his kayak. As she clings to the sides, he chops off her fingers, and she sinks to the underworld, becoming the ruler of the monsters of the deep. Her huge fingers become seals, walruses, and whales, hunted by the Inuit. Okay? Which is interesting. In another version of the legend, she's dissatisfied with the men found for her by her father, so she marries a dog. Her father is so angry at this that he throws her into the sea, and when she tries to climb back into the boat, he cuts off her fingers. And of course... Her fingers become the first seals, and she becomes a mighty sea goddess. When she is angered, the shaman travels to wash and comb her hair for her, after which she is placated and releases animals to the hunters. In other versions, she is unable to comb her hair because she lacks fingers, so a shaman must brush it for her, Uh, which is interesting. I'm curious to know what that ritual is like. Um, In the Netsalik region, the story states that... um, she was a mistreated orphan. One day the people tried to get rid of her by attempting to drown her by chopping off her fingertips, but the fingertips transformed into seals and walruses. Eventually she marries a sculpin and lives in the sea controlling all sea mammals. Um, let me see, a sculpin is, oh, it's a type of fish. Okay, uh, so this is a, I haven't heard of that one. Okay, so she, so she marries a fish and she stays in the sea and she controls all sea mammals. That isn't, that's, One of the more common things I see her associated with are sea mammals, Um, like like seals and walruses and whales. Uh, Other versions of the legend depict Sedna as a beautiful maiden who rejects marriage proposals from the hunters of her village. When an unknown hunter appears, Sedna's father agrees to give her to him as wife in return for fish. Sedna's father gives Sedna a sleeping potion and gives her to the hunter who takes her to a large nest on a cliff, revealing his true form a great bird spirit. Uh, She wakes surrounded by birds. Her father attempts to rescue her, but the bird spirit becomes angry, causing a great storm. In desperation, Sedna's father throws her into the raging sea. Attempting to cling to the kayak, her hands freeze and her fingers fall off before becoming the creatures of the sea. She falls to the bottom of sea and grows a fishtail. Okay, so that one involves birds, which um, is interesting. We'll talk about that, you know, at least the way that that tends to be seen in symbology. Uh, And sometimes the bird is noted as being a raven, a fulmar, or a um, coxaw petrel, uh, you know, spirit. So one of these uh, types of birds. 
Uh, in another one, she's kidnapped and deceived by a different bird creature in yet another version. Her father then leaves in his kayak to rescue her from the floating ice island where she's imprisoned while the bird creature is away. The creature, enraged by her disappearance, calls the spirit of the sea to help him. The sea spirit locates the kayak with the two humans aboard and creates huge waves to kill them. Her father throws Sedna overboard in the hope it will appease the angry god. Sedna clings to the kayak, but her father grabs a little axe and chops three of her fingers before striking her on the head. The three fingers each become a different species of seal. The stroke to her head sends her to the ocean floor, where she resides commanding animals of the sea. Okay. So there's a couple different ones, um, you know, a couple other ones that are mentioned here. But as you can see, these are all, they offer different, the, the death is the same. She's clinging to the side of a kayak. She has her fingers chopped off or frozen off, and she falls to the bottom of the ocean. And for varying reasons, okay? But the the interesting thing is the, um, you know, this is her, she sinks to the bottom, and it says she's worshipped by hunters who depend on her goodwill to supply food because she is the one who is in charge of the sea mammals. So if they're not seeing as many, then they have to pray, you know, that, you know, if they, they feel like they're um, hunting, there's, there's not much, you know, prey to hunt if they don't have uh, the, you know, they're, they're seeing a decline in the number of creatures, then they pray to Sedna and, and appeal to her because they feel that she's gotten angry at them somehow and is withholding the sea creatures from her. Um, so, uh, and as offerings, they people throw out, they threw to her worn-out harpoon heads, broken knives, and morsels of meat and bone as offerings. So, okay. Now, that's, that's one aspect of her myth, okay? That is the myth of Sedna as sea goddess. Um, but we also see that she is the, um, you know, the, the goddess uh, that rules the underworld, as well as the creatures of the sea. And the underworld in the Inuit is called uh, Adlavun. And we'll talk about that place in a moment. Uh, now, she is, uh, okay, as, as an underworld deity, um, we have it that, uh, okay, here's the story that's listed here. When her father came to visit her, Sedna asked him to take her home. Okay, this, is, this has to do with the bird story, when she's married to a bird. Uh, lead, it says she led an unhappy existence in a flimsy shelter with only raw fish to eat. Um, and uh, apparently the... Bird had promised she would live in luxury for the rest of her days, but it was a lie. So when her father came to visit, Sedna asked him to take her home. Her father killed her husband and set off in his boat with Sedna. However, the other birds stirred up a raging storm on the water. To calm the sea, Sedna's father threw her overboard as an offering to the birds. As in the other tale, she hung on until he cut off her fingers. In some versions, Sedna's father hauled her back into the boat. However, angered by her father's cruelty, she had her dogs try to eat him while, she, while he slept. When her father awoke, he cursed himself, Sedna, and her dogs. The ground opened up and swallowed them all, and Sedna became goddess of the underworld. Okay, so that's another version of the myth in which she becomes, uh, in addition to being a keeper of sea mammals, she is also the queen of, or the ruler of the underworld. Okay, so what do we know about Sedna's attributes? Well, we know that Sedna is female, but she's often represented as a giant, particularly in the story where she is extremely hungry and tries to devour her father's arm, uh, she is, uh, you know, she is re she's represented as a giantess. And so when they, you know, he cuts off her fingers, you know, yes, obviously they, they develop, they have to be, they're very large fingers that develop into these sea mammals. Um, so, uh, so, this, so this is very interesting. There's, there's several things that we can look at here. And the things I want to look at with respect to Sedna are, first of all, her, you know, her connection, not only her connection to the underworld, but what it means that she is a giant, okay, that she is a giant. The meaning of chopping off the fingers, since obviously that's, that's key, and, and sending her down to the depths. Um, and also, as part of this, I want to talk a little bit about um, Inuit uh, myth and religion, and, you know, how that, how, how their uh, beliefs, their animistic beliefs, uh, inform this particular mythology. Uh, and what, what we might just take away from it on a, uh, you know, in, in a, the sense of the, the religious or mythological symbolism that's there. So, okay. First place I want to, um, want to talk about is the idea of Sedna as giant. So we've talked, um, I had read a bit when I uh, did 
uh, another podcast, um, and uh, you know, a couple years ago, where we talked about giants, and the the idea of the giant. Okay, the giant is a bit like if we want to. Okay, if, if you want to think about something to compare it to in Greek mythology, the idea of the Titans, the idea of these primordial beings that came out of um, from uh, Gaia and Uranus that are eventually, um, you know, when when Kronos starts devouring and swallowing all of his children, then this, this um, you know, um, eventually Zeus forces him to disgorge everybody. You know, Zeus is hidden from him. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> and this battle between the Olympians and Titans ensues, which is generally viewed as a, the Titans are, um, you know, they represent the kind of chthonic forces. They represent the the primordial forces of nature, uh, and they are literally chthonic because they are they are children of Gaia, uh, most uh, specifically. And they come from the first children of Gaia, which are the, there's you know there's uh, you know four or five different elements you know that come out of chaos. There's the void. There's the depth. There's um, you know there's the gloom of, of Erebus. There's uh, Eros actually comes out of this, um, you know, that, that drive or desire. And then you also have Nyx, and you also have uh, Gaia, you know, the Earth Mother, who also comes out of that um, initial set. So here we have, um, but, but nonetheless, when we see this in, in different mythologies, we see this idea of the giants. And the giants can act as, uh, as daemons in the sense of being messengers to gods. Uh, in, in some in some mythologies, that's what they are. But a lot of times, they do represent these raging primal forces. And Sedna, as a deity who is associated with, um, you know, she seems to be a child who uh, is, you know, her her father throws her overboard. Now, regardless of the version of the story, um, you know, you do have to wonder about, you know, this idea of the, the father trying to get rid of, rid of her or unsaddle her. And, and what he does is he, he does that cut. He does that separation. Remember what I've said about creation myths and separation, that they, they, they move us into a different space and into a different um, paradigm. Now, in Inuit mythology, uh, the cutting off of the fingers is also um, interesting there because, and, you know, and then thus creating the animals, uh, these mammals, particularly of the sea. Um, and, you know, so she's, so, you know, there's this, so there's this connection here to the idea of Tiamat almost as well, who is the primordial creature of Babylonian mythology, who makes up all of the, the, the firmament of the earth and, and the land and, and, you know, becomes almost a land goddess, uh, in that, in that way of, you know, even though she is in that case, a monster of the sea. Now Sedna doesn't start out as a monster of the sea. But she ends up becoming a kind of a sea creature growing a fishtail, uh, as they've noted. Um, now, Sedna's disposition is said to be very angry, you know, for being tossed overboard um, by the father. So there has to be, you know, she has to be handled with care. And if she's neglected, then there's the uh, possibility that she is going to withhold the food source from the people, which would be the sea mammals. So uh, she would have to be appeased and asked to, you know, she, it's said that she holds the animals in her pen, so she has to release them. Um, and it's interesting, too, that in some stories she's portrayed as having been human and now becomes this kind of uh, a being, okay? Uh, and there's, there's some explanation for that when we look at uh, the way Inuit mythology is, the, the, the context of it, the broad context of it. Okay, so we have this, um, you know, again, we have this, this cutting apart, this cutting apart to, to create something and to separate something. Now, Sedna is a giantess. Um, giants also, te- not only do they represent these uh, primordial forces, but in some versions, according to Marie-Louise von Franz, uh, it was sort of like they were attempts at making humans that didn't quite work out, out so well. Um, and another version of that we can see in the Book of Enoch, you know, when angels meet, mate with humans and create these gigantic beings. So they're very powerful beings, but they're also very chaotic. And so the idea of the father figure throwing her over into the water, and, you know, you know it's that idea of taking that um, very chaotic feminine, that de- and devouring, by the way. I mean, at least in the one version of the story, she is, um, he, she angers him because she is... Uh, you know, because she tries to devour his arm. 
uh, that you know, so it, that's a very very clear reference to you. Know, you can see the element of the dark feminine being overthrown by the masculine, which will um, you know it want, wants to um, get rid of, submerge, or repress. Uh, that's one way of looking at you know throwing that particular element under the sea, just as in the Titanomachy when you imprison the Titans in the depths of Tartarus. You're you know into the depths of the underworld. You're you're putting something out of the way. You're trying to control um, and subdue these kinds of chaotic forces. Uh, now, let me talk about the underworld for a moment. In uh, the Inuit religion, um, it's called Adlivon, which means those who live beneath us. Okay, and it's uh, and there's another name which I'm not going to try to read that it, it can be known as. But it suggests in this region uh, are spirits of the departed uh, who reside in the underworld and by the extension, the underworld itself, located between the land and the sea. Okay, so there we have again this liminal, this in-between place um, that is connected connected to the sea. If we think about the underworld in a lot of cultures, it uh, can be under the earth, it can be under the sea, it can be in a cave. And oftentimes when you, you, we see caverns as being that this connection between the land and the sea. You see others examples of this in, um, you know, what we'll call, you know, in the mythology of the Americas, shall we say, both north and south. You have this idea of accessing the underworld through some kind of underground tunnel or cave that's underwater. Um, now, in this particular underworld, the souls don't stay there. They don't die and stay in Adlivan. They're purified there in preparation for travel to the land of the moon which is um, Quidlivan, which is the uppermost ones, where they find eternal rest and peace. Now, this is interesting because it is a, that, that, that sounds almost, not like, a, not like a heaven and a hell, but more like a purg- purgatory and, and a heaven. You know, like there's no hell, you know, there's no eternal punishment for anybody. It's just you either go to, you know, you, you hang out in the lower regions for a while until you're ready to go to the upper regions. Uh, now, purification you might think of in a platonic sense of one losing losing one's density in order to be able to travel through the air to a lighter place, which is the way Plato would have uh, conceived of this in his um, in his thought. Um, now, uh, but the idea that it's and of course this is um, represented as a place that is frozen. Okay, it's usually described as a frozen wasteland where people go to be purified, as opposed to the more Western idea that this place of purging is actually a place of fire, where it's like the the impurities are burned out, you know, like, you know, in this case, they're frozen out. Um, It's, you know, it's the, what is it, cryo versus, um, what was the other one? They used to do certain kinds of surgeries on women. There was cryosurgery, and then there was the one where they they burned it out, um, and uh, I'm trying to remember what that's called, but it's it's basically the opposition between those those two those two methods of of removing whatever it is that needs to be removed. Now that's it's curious about the idea of purification because I don't know whether this implies that they have an idea of sin, uh, an atonement, which is not necessarily uh, inherent. Uh, there, it's not necessarily a sense of judgment. It's not clear what they're being purified from. Okay. Uh, in this particular, at least in the in the information that I've been able to find, um, it's just simply that you know they they go through a period of purification of some kind, and then they rise up to the moon, uh, which uh, again I did compare this to in my mind to the Greek afterlife, uh, at least later versions of it, Neoplatonic versions. We see the realm of Hecate as being the realm of the moon, um, although the sun is considered to be sort of the ultimate place where one would go. Uh, in, in the Inuit mythology, people go to the moon, and that is where um, they they live. Now, it says, Sedna is ruler of this land, and is said to imprison souls of the living as part of the preparation for the next stage of their journey. Okay, and again, um, I imagine there's probably something in their uh, shamanic traditions that would explain this, but it doesn't really say. Um now, in the Adlivan, besides Sedna and besides this, these souls are the, uh, let me see if I'm saying that right, Torngasuk and the Tornat, which are spirits of animals and natural formations. So nature spirits are there, the elemental spirits. And Tupalak, which, is, which are the souls of the dead. So this is interesting, too, because if we think about fairy lore, 
And fairy, if you think about fairies as being a version of elementals or nature spirits of some kind, uh, it's interesting that they they live in this chthonic space, this this wasteland, this frozen wasteland. Um, you know, this rather harsh earth climate. Uh, that they live there along with Sedna, um, who is this primordial giantess, at least in one version, and the souls of the dead. Because in fairy lore, a lot of times there is there's a mixing, there's a lot of a mixing and matching between are they souls of the dead who have changed into some other kind of form? Um, <clears throat> or we think about the idea of fairies and, and humans being swapped. But there there has been frequently, you know, the connection discussed between what we think of as fairies or nature spirits and the souls of the dead. So here we actually have a mythology that suggests that the two of them reside together, at least temporarily after death. And Pinga and Anguta, now Anguta being her father, bring the souls of dead to Ad Adlavan, where they must stay for one year before moving on. Okay, so that's interesting. Now, again, you see I'm comparing it to Greek mythology and other things. I'm really noting the similarities. It's it's not, you know, one doesn't come from the other. You know, they're not, they're, they're disconnected by ge geography, by language, by all kinds of things. So the concept, the fact that you have similar concepts is quite interesting. Um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about the religion of the Inuit. So they have, uh, so there, there are people um, between uh, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. Okay, you have, you have Inuit uh, in all those places. And they said their religion shares similarities with many Alaskan native religions. Uh, and the traditional practices do include animism and shamanism, um, in which the spiritual healers that mediate with spirits. Shamans are, pe are, are um, people who are trained to have a foot in both worlds, okay? particularly in these societies. Um, there's other shamanic traditions that we see here that people are trained in who are not um, part of the Native American traditions. Um, there's shaman, there's there's shamans in in a lot of cultures. It's not you know it's it's usually um, what we think of as Aboriginal. And when I say Aboriginal, I don't just mean Australia. Um, whatever the original peoples are, shamanism seems to be part of the the religious system. And um, and and the shaman moves between the worlds to to provide healing to um, you know perhaps possibly for a person who might be afflicted, but also um, for you know. It possibly for other reasons. For example, in the myth where we see they go to comb the hair of Sedna because she can't uh, comb it herself. Uh, you know, there there may there's some special ritual that is meant to keep the balance, the natural balance, uh, in uh, in order. Okay, so that uh, you don't so you don't upset that balance. Now, here here's an interesting quote about Inuit cosmology. Uh, this is from, and again, I'm, I've, I've taken this off Wikipedia, but it's Rachel uh, Quitsualik um, Quitsu, Tinsley. Okay, again, hoping I'm saying her name correctly. She says, The Inuit cosmos is ruled by no one. There's no divine mother and father figures. There are no wind gods and solar creatures. There are no eternal punishments in the hereafter, as there are no punishments for children or adults in the here and now. And that's rather interesting. Um, so back to my original query about where are the Dark Mothers? Well, there, there aren't very many of them, apparently. Now, this is at least in the Inuit. Now, we can't, can't speak for other native cultures because you can't just say that they're all the same because they're not. Um, but the idea that there's no creator. So here is a cosmos without a creator. Um, and in fact, the, you know, the implication is that there are some kinds of primordial forces that are represented by people. Or there seems to be the sense that, um, you know, these sort of extraordinary humans, you know, primal humans, somehow are the ones that uh, shape the way that things are. Uh, now, she there goes on to say here, traditional stories, rituals, and taboos of the Inuit are often precautions against dangers posed by the harsh Arctic environment, which makes sense when you think about the frozen nature of certain things and the importance of having uh, the sea mammals. Uh, it is noted in this article, as I read through it earlier, that certain Inuit, I think I want to say it's the Caribou Inuit, they uh, live inland. So goddesses like Sedna are not quite as important to them because they're not reliant upon the sea uh, for their livelihood or for their, their food. Um, and somebody had mentioned uh, an Angakuk, the, uh, a spiritual healer or shaman, 
among the Inuits had said, uh, we don't believe, we fear. Now, somebody noted that this um, particular uh, Angakuk actually eventually uh, converted to Christianity, so, you know, that, that may or may not be a biased statement. Um, you know, that, so, you know, so, so whether that's really true or not is difficult to say. But nonetheless, there is an element of this religion uh, that is, again, is very much like other primal religions of its type. You know, you have, you, you are, you are, you recognize your place in forces of nature that are capricious and that can, you know, can, you know and, and you are at their mercy. You know, if, uh, yeah, if, if not enough mammals come out of the sea and you can't hunt, then your, you know, your, your livelihood's in trouble, your food source is in trouble. You know, if you, if they, if you have gods that bring storms or that, um, you know, you know, ca- you know, cause certain other kinds of catastrophes. You know, the, these are forces that you know you have to contend with to survive, and you see that very, very um, mentioned. It's it's very um, apparent in the Inuit uh, beliefs. So, um, let's see. So this was uh, so just seeing what there's what they have to say about the the different uh, tribes. Um, they, they talk about the Inuit at um, Amit Sok Lake, um, which talks about prohibitions for um, sewing, you know, sewing sitenums, at, like boot soles at certain times of year. Um, so these are all, you know, sort of local customs and things. Um, but um, the Netsalik Inuit, um, meaning people of the seal, have very long winters and stormy springs, and starvation was a common danger. Um, it says the Netzalik have traditional beliefs that life's hardships stemmed from the extensive use of, um, you know, um, such measures, meaning having to do with uh, protective guardian powers. Um, you know, so the um, so unlike the um, Ig- Igalik Inuit, the Netzalik used a large number of amulets, so they they had protective charms. Even dogs could have amulets, and in one recorded instance, a young boy had 80 amulets, so many that he could hardly play. Um, one particular man had 17 names taken from his ancestors intended to protect him. So, yeah, there's this idea that the, the child soul is very, very weak, and it needs to be protected um, by the ancestors. So, you know, you see this element of ancestor worship in here as well. Um, you know, where, you know, you've got the spirits of nature and and the spirits of humans, you don't see a separation there. You don't see humans as being somehow uh, superior to animals. Uh, In fact, there's one place in here. um, So let me see the, um, yes, and they talk about um, uh, Sedna here as uh, Nuliajuk, the sea woman, the, um, the lubricus one. So if people breached taboos, uh, she would hold the marine animals, and then um, people had to beg her for game. The, the shamans had to go. Um, there's another moon man, a cosmic being, benevolent towards humans and their souls as they arrived in celestial palaces. This belief di- di- differs from the Greenlandic Inuit, in which the moon's wrath could be invoked by breaking taboos. Okay. Um, and let's see. And then there's another giant called uh, Sila or Silap Inua, which is imagined as male, um, that would control the weather. Now the, um, okay, so the uh, Caribou Inuit, um, their shamans perform fortune-telling um, through uh, Kila Neck, a technique of asking questions to a Kila or spirit. And uh, the Anu... Um, Anakuk placed his glove on the ground and raised his staff and belt over it. The Kila then entered the glove and drew the staff to itself. And uh, this was also another way of um, providing yes or no answers to questions. Um, okay, so there's uh, so you know there, there's some there's some of these other practices from these tribes. I don't need to read all of these or look at them, but um, they believe. Okay, their idea of a spirit or soul is called the. Um, uh, Anernik, or um, Anernit, I think is how you might say it. And again, I, I'm I'm guessing at pronunciation here. But all things have a spirit or soul, so it's not. So those are not just the souls of humans; the souls of all things. These spirits are held to persist after death. Um, the pervasive, the belief in pervasive, the pervasiveness of spirits, 
the root of the Inuit worldview has consequences. According to a customary Inuit saying, the great peril of our existence lies in the fact that our diet consists entirely of souls. And now that's an interesting statement because what I've, what I've often taught when I teach creation myth of any kind is that a lot of times mythology is, at least the, these primordial mythologies, are ad addressing the fact that life requires death. And I've said this before, and I, a lot of times I don't feel like my students quite get it. They think more of things of, of consuming and the idea of like a consumer culture or something like that. And I said, no, this devouring is the way in which, um, you know, there was a, there's a Hindu myth of um, Kirti Mukha, uh, of the shining face of uh, this monster, uh, that Shiva commands to eat itself. And this is really, it, 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 this idea of life eating itself is, uh, it, it's, it's one, of the, one, of the, one of these tremendous mysteries that we have of existence. You know, why is it you have to feed on other conscious and living beings? You know, people who don't like death, and, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an ugly fact that, because, you know, even, as I've said, even if you're a vegetarian, you, you I mean, plants are living things. All things are living. Trees, plants, you know, all, all these things are living. Anything you take from there is something that's alive. You don't, there's no such thing as, well, I don't eat meat, so therefore I don't kill living things. You, everything is living, okay? We just have different moral standards about what can be killed and not killed. And, to, and honestly, our biology probably dictates a lot of that, too. Um, you, know, you know, cannibalism doesn't usually, um, <clears throat> you know, fly well with, the, uh, with, our, with our biological systems. Um, or, or any others, like, you know, mad cow disease came from cows eating other dead cows. So it's, you know, it's not, um, not, not always the, the best thing in that sense, but, but yeah, but life feeds on itself. Okay. And so they said, since all beings possess souls, like those of humans, killing an animal is a little different from killing a person. Uh, once the, um, the aronic of the dead animal or human is liberated, it's free to take revenge. The spirit of the dead can only be placated by obedience to custom, avoiding taboos, and performing the right rituals. Now, again, this sounds like uh, the way in which natural forces are approached in just about every human culture. Um, you, you appease the force. You appease it through uh, sacrifices. You appease it through ritual. Um, this is the way that you interact. Um, some of it's symbolic. Some of it, um, actually, maybe a lot of it's symbolic. Because if you want to take the idea that these are real spirits, that they are real things, or represent real forces and not, as some people like to say, merely psychological ones, although I've explained before why I don't believe in something being merely psychological, I think that they're tied together. Um, because your relationship and connection is processed through your psychology, um, or through the collective psychology, which is not a thought in your head, necessarily. Often it's an unconscious thing. But in any case... Um, <clears throat> so the idea then becomes, um, you know, uh, you know, you're, you, it's you <clears throat> living in society, in nature and trying to find a way to communicate or have a relationship with nature, which is a lot, a lot of which is done through, um, what we think of now as magical practices, what we think of as, um, divinations and oracles you know, trying to understand what nature is trying to tell you, what nature spirits are trying to tell you, and then trying to try to act in harmony or accord with that, okay? And understanding that no matter what you do, there could be a situation where they become angered or, do, or take some kind of unexpected action, and that's just how it is. And what I find interesting about the, the more ancient form of religion that this can represent versus what we now think of as religion in its very moral sense you know, we, we have scriptures and doctrines and morals and, and all this stuff. I mean, we have rules and rituals, too, in religions, in modern religions. But there's this sense that this is, um, you know, you know when, when you try to take this very um, moralistic view of things, we, we've taken ourselves outside of nature. We're put above it. We're separate from it. And uh, this, this really leaves us uh, very disconnected, as far as I'm concerned, with with everything, with, um, with the primordial, uh, you know, with being able to kind of see the world as it is or being able to see it in that light and to be able to work in harmony with it in that light. Um, and also it means that we as a culture are very, have very difficult time dealing with 
uh, things that are unexpected. Uh, we don't we don't like surprises. <laughs> I mean, you know, unless they're good surprises, I guess. But most of the time, we don't. You know, the trickster element. Uh, if you want to go arch- speak in archetypal terms, the trickster element is one that people generally do not like. Sometimes the trickster can be funny. You know, sometimes unexpected things can be hilarious. Other times they're not so hilarious in in their consequences, and so people tend to associate the trickster with the devil. You know, there's this idea of it being. Um, something unpredictable and therefore something suspicious and perhaps something evil. And to take that view is to really take the view that nature and everything having to do with it is also evil. So um, it's, it's instructive to look at these uh, kinds of um, belief systems or looking back at animistic belief systems, you know, as, you know, as a general rule. And, you know, it's not so much that, aha, these people all think that there were spirits and everything. Well, first of all, you don't know that there aren't. Um, you know, as I've always said, you know, the, the, what, what we pr- process internally or whatever it may mean to our psychology or our consciousness doesn't mean that there isn't something external. Okay. Um, I feel like it's, it's both. And there are, you know, the, the spirits that are in nature, but we, we've just, you know, and this is, you know, at least part of the reason why we feel so isolated a lot of the time, because we're not, we're not connected in that way. And there's a need to reconnect in that way. If we, if we want to, if we want to experience that feeling of being alive, of wholeness, of being in the process. Um, and sometimes that's, sometimes that's, um, invigorating and life affirming. Other times it's scary. Um, but you know, but at all times it's just, it's a, it's a different space that you're in that doesn't, um, that doesn't separate, that doesn't create these kinds of hierarchies. Um, it, it's, you know, you and you, you're on the same terms as nature and you should work with it, you know, on those terms as, you know, we're all, we're all trying to get on together. And, and oftentimes what you'll see in native mythologies is native American mythologies or Aboriginal mythologies is, a you know, certain rites and rituals to say, okay, you know, we need to kill and eat you, but, you know, there's, there's some kind of a trade-off or, or some, some kind of ritual for bringing back the soul of the animal or, or something like that. There's, there's some modicum of respect shown for what's happening there. And, uh, because it's, because it's a necessary part of life to, to, to say, you know, so, and it also has a lot to do with the death attitude too. You know, death is, is, is expected. But and but here we see a mythology that says death is not, you know, yes, you have a year on this frozen wasteland where, again, you're being purified of something. I, I don't, I'm not, it's not really clear specifically what that is. Um, if any of you are familiar with this mythology and know what that is, that would be great. I'd, I'd appreciate a comment on that. Um, but then, of course, then there's this peaceful existence on the moon. So, you know, at that point, you transcend and... Uh, you know, that, that may have something to do, uh, with, again, I, I, it makes me think of the platonic idea of, you know, getting rid of your density so that you can rise to the next level. Um, which also makes me think about just as a kind of, um, final comment here is the idea that, um, you know, of, of the birds, Sedna being abducted by birds or, you know, being married to a bird. And, you know, and that, that she eventually sinks to the depths. Um, but her, you know, you know, she's married to the birds and then her separation from them angers them. They, 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 you know, cause this great raging storm on the water. And it, it's, again, it's worth noting that the bird, that birds or the term for birds, as we can see, they, they mentioned that the, the name for soul that they have in the Inuit uh, does refer to breath. It does refer to, um, you know, again, just like, just like it does in, in the Egyptian, you know, has, has this idea, the, um, certainly in, in the, the Greek words, uh, and, and the Roman words or Latin words that we say have these, have these inflections of breath or of something in the air or something that, that flies. And so birds often are connected with the idea of souls. So it almost is like this idea of Sedna being brought to be a shepherd of souls. And when she's, you know, married to this, um, you know, this, what you might think of as this representation of the soul. And then she decides she's going to leave. Um, you know, they get very angry and then she ends up having to be sunk down to the underworld where she becomes a tender of souls, you know, who come to her, you know, before they, they continue on their journey. So 
interesting. I mean, not I, I, whether or not that is, you know, the intention or the inflection that the Inuit have, I, I really don't know. But, um, you know, but these are all the connections that I can potentially make here uh, from looking at these. And I, and I, and I still find it interesting, um, especially in myth theory, you know, where people claim that there's, there's no universality to things. You know, well, yeah, obviously different cultures, you know, things are interpreted differently and mean different things in, in different places. But it's very interesting when it comes to, to death and these death images, um, how much actually is, is similar. And it's, un, it's not really clear exactly why they're so similar, but there just seems to be this, um, this, in, this, this inflection in human culture that appears no matter where it is or whether or not there's a common language or whether or not, you know, they met up with people who, you know, might have known this or, or, or heard, you know, it might have been able to tell them other stories. It's, it's, it's not, you know, I don't feel like it's a myth that like it started in one place and spread to other places. Sure, you do have places where, where it happens, where learning the mythologies or the, or the, the traditions or the religion of another place will um, eventually get that, as your community diversifies, you can blend those concepts in with your community. But um, I always feel with these groups, it's, it's a little bit different. And I'm always um, fascinated by how, how similar they are. Um, it doesn't necessarily prove anything, but, <clears throat> um, but I do find it interesting that they, that there's this, that there's such, there's can be such a similarity in the way that we think about ideals of soul uh, this relationship to the breath, this relationship of the underworld to the depths, um, the, this feminine image, this idea of, you know, uh, you know, this related image of cutting up the feminine or the feminines, but, you know, uh, being, you know, having to be taken apart to, uh, you know, to create things. And, uh, you know, it, it's just, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to contemplate what, um, what that says both about um, our connection to what I would call the collective unconscious or collective psychology, um, that is that is primordial, that that does go back, not, not, not psychology as in the collection of your thoughts, but as this kind of storehouse of all of human experience and, um, and, and whatever, you know, numinous force lies within that and how that connects with or, you know, it may be similar to or same as, uh, or the relationship at least to external forces that are undoubtedly out in the world as well. Um, that's all I have to say on Sedna. I want to thank you again for listening. Uh, please visit Cthonia.net for all my work. Um, if you want to catch up with what I'm doing, the, the latest um, on, you know, on updates that I'm doing that may or may not make it on the website, at least not right away, please check out uh, pay, um, social media, uh, Cthonia Podcast, two words on Facebook, one word on Instagram and Twitter and just Cthonia on YouTube. And uh, if you subscribe there, then, you know, as new videos come out of these podcasts, uh, you will get notified. And if you join my Patreon, at least at the $5 level and above, I do provide extra content. Um, you know, anybody lower than $5 is, a, you know, thanks very much, and I appreciate your support. Um, at the $5 level and above, it's, you know, extra podcasts, extra podcast material from longer interviews, um, and, and other things, uh, there's going to be, I'm, I'm hoping to build up that community, uh, over this year. So we will, uh, you know, so we can make it a, a little bit more robust and that I can offer more things in terms of reward. Uh, that's it for me in this episode and thanks for listening. Thanks again so much to my patrons until next time.